My number two best game of the 2010s is the game Wei Yi vs. Bruzon. This fantastic game was played just one month after Wei Yi turned 16 years old, and it has been given many names. It's been called Wei Yi's Immortal and the Chinese Immortal, but my favorite name is the Quiet Move Immortal. That's because after Wei Yi spectacularly sacrifices a rook and a bishop, he uses multiple very subtle moves to bring down Bruzon's king. Wei Yi is a famous and feared Sicilian player, and this game is just one reason why. Now, in this game, Bruzon is going to initially start with a time on off Sicilian, where he's playing a6 and e6, taking the queen on c7 with a knight on c6. But after a few more moves, he's going to go ahead and play pawn to d6 in this structure, and we get into a classic Scheveningen structure. The Scheveningen in the Sicilian is the structure here with the pawns on e6 and d6. This was a great battleground for Garry Kasparov and Anatoly Karpov, and this game is similar to the structures that those fought in. Now, from here, we're going to be proceeding with a lot of theory. These games have been played many thousands of times. Here, black trades on d4 so as to be able to play pawn to b5. If you try to play pawn to b5 without playing uh, the trade on d4, then after knight takes c6, queen takes c6, pawn e5 exposes problems on this diagonal and turns out very, very badly for black. So after the trade on d4 and the push pawn b5, we get queen g3, eyeing this square over here with the queen and the bishop's cooperation. Bishop b7 threatening e4, but after a3, you can't take on e4 because capturing eventually with the knight will lead to mate on g7, so the e4 pawn is safe for the moment. We get rook a to d8, rook a e1, two sort of mysterious rook moves, rook to d7, and bishop d3. Now, I think this is a good point for another mysterious rook move from black. The move rook to e8 in this position has been resilient. It recalls the great move from Garry Kasparov against Anatoly Karpov, where in their world championship match, he played this in the critical final game. So after this, black has actually done fairly well in the position, but after Bruzon's move queen to d8, uh, in fact, black has really, really struggled. Now we get queen to h3 with ideas of pawn to e5, trying to remove the knight so that there can be checkmate on h7. Now really clever here was now to play rook e8, which probably isn't as good as playing it a moment ago without retreating the queen to d8. But at least here, you're not getting checkmated after you move the rook and create some escapes for your king. Now, if you try e5 and we trade here, then d4 hangs, rook takes d4, and after taking on f6 and bishop takes f6, if you capture on h7, the king can actually get away, and this isn't so bad for black. Now, white probably has better options, but in the game, after the queen h3 g6 move instead of rook to e8, then black is probably already in a great deal of trouble and maybe even lost in this position. The natural move that Wei Yi does play is pawn to f5 right here. This is kicking right into these squares here, and especially with the queen on h3, e6 is in a lot of trouble. As a result, the only sensible move is to try to move the e6 pawn so that it can't be captured. We play pawn to e5 right here. The bishop falls back to e3. Now comes rook e8, but after the g6 and f5 structure has been reached, this is a little bit too late for the move rook to e8. There's a lot of trouble brewing here on the f file and not enough time for black to coordinate a defense. So here we get pawn takes g6, and I want to mention, check the notes to this game. f takes g6 was a better move, though it's still very, very good for Wei Yi. Instead, after h takes g6, you can pause the video if you want to try and figure out how Wei Yi continues from this position. Part of the brilliance of what comes next is that Wei Yi did not have to commit all his chips at this point. He could have played, for example, rook f2 and rook f1 with very simple moves he can maintain a huge advantage and very likely win the game before too long. However, he spots a knockout blow and he goes for it. He plays knight to d5. Now, this is a committal move. There's a ton of pressure here and there's a threat of bishop to b6, so black really doesn't have a choice other than to accept the offering of the knight. After knight takes d5, if you recapture, then you have less than nothing, you've lost a critical center pawn, and black's bishop holds everything together. So after knight to d5, knight takes d5, you must follow up with rook 
takes f7. Now, this is brilliant, but remember, it had to be seen when knight d5 came, so maybe knight d5 is the more brilliant move. Also, this move right here isn't too crazy. You'll find this move or one very like it in a lot of puzzle books where the rook is sacrificed on f7 or maybe h7, and then the queen comes in and it's just checkmate in a move or two. Here, though, it is not just checkmate in a move or two. White has to follow up with creative brilliance to actually deliver checkmate. Now, there's only one way to try to decline the rook sacrifice because there is the threat of queen to h7 checkmate. You could try knight to f6 here, pulling back and defending h7. Now, the way to go in is queen to e6, and this move is winning. However, if earlier, instead of capturing with the h pawn on g6, you had chosen to capture with the f pawn so that you still had a pawn on h7, then this wouldn't be so decisive. The king needs to move out of the way of the threat and discovered checks, and then you have bishop to g5 piling up here. Now, this is a winning position, but if there were a pawn on h7 and g6 were not loose, you could try to move the knight. Here, if you move the knight, there's just queen takes g6. So that actually suggests that on move 20, Bruzon could have captured with the other pawn, and although he probably would have been losing the game pretty soon, he wouldn't have lost in such an immediate and decisive fashion. So, backing up though, after rook takes f7, because knight f6, queen e6 does not work in this position, Bruzon does go ahead and accept the rook sacrifice with king takes f7. Now, the clear intended follow-up is queen to h7 check. The rook sacrifice was a decoy to get the queen in here. Now, if you fall back with king f8, it's just mate in one, bishop h6 checkmate. That's not too hard. That's not why the game is immortal. Also, if the king tries to go to f6, it's pretty clear that going to f6 is worse than going to e6 for a few reasons. The biggest one is just that e takes d5 covers the e6 square, and you threaten queen takes g6. So queen takes g6 in combination with rook f1 is going to end the game in very, very short order. So after queen h7 check, the king does try to go to e6. Now, of course, we can't just take here because there are blocks that save the material and the checkmates. So we actually have to follow up here uh, with e takes d5 check. I will mention that an alternative that clearly doesn't win is after king e6 to check here and the king goes back and then you can have a perpetual. Now, of course, Wei Yi doesn't want a perpetual, but it's always good when you're calculating this kind of thing to have a perpetual in the pocket. So if you can't see things quite to the end, you can go for it if your intuition is telling you that it should be enough to checkmate. And then after you get to the point where you need to decide whether to take the perpetual, then you can try to look for that finishing blow that might be hard to find earlier. Of course, ideally, you want to calculate and be sure the finish is there before you sacrifice the material. So after king to e6, we do take on d5 check. Now, if you take with the bishop, you have a very nice move here. Bishop takes g6. Now, the king is cut off. You're threatening queen to f7 checkmate. So moving this bishop doesn't stop the checkmate on f7. And here, if you try rook f8, for example, to defend uh, mate on uh, f7 or on f5, then you just have queen to h3 check. The king moves over. And here we have rook to f1 check. And after the bishop on g6 falls, you have mate here on h6. One of many, many nice checkmates in this game. So... After king takes d5, once again, Wei Yi has to find a brilliant move to continue the attack. At this point, you might think that the game is easy for white after all, the king on d5 looks like he should be dead in the water, but black is not that far away from king c6, king c7, and before long, you're wondering what happened to your great position, what happened to your rook, and in fact, black is winning. So white actually only has one move to continue the attack decisively here. And that is bishop to e4 check. Now, this drags the king forward so the king will not be able to escape, and he stays in a mating net in the middle of the board. Now, if you try to pull back with the king and not accept the bishop sacrifice with king to e6, it's not surprising that white is winning, but we should still pause and appreciate the lines. Queen takes g6 check here is strong. Of course, bishop f6 is the only legal move in the position, and you might actually struggle to find more than, for example, a perpetual check here. But one decisive line is queen f5 check. After the king falls back, you have queen h7 check. 
And if the king goes forward here again, you don't have a perpetual. Well, you do, but better still is bishop check here. The king can run, but you pick up a rook. The attack continues, and this is totally decisive. Also, if the king here had tried to hide um, instead of going to e6 after queen h7 check, but had gone back to f8, then it's not surprising that bishop h6 is a decisive move. You have to block here on g7. After rook g7, rook f1 here, there's a threat of mate here on g7 by taking the rook since the bishop is pinned. If you defend that, then queen h8 check followed by taking the rook on g7 is thoroughly decisive. So, after analyzing that, which probably didn't take Bruzon that long, he decided he must have gone ahead and he must go ahead and take the bishop on e4. So we do get king takes e4 in this position. Now, this is the one moment in the game where you can definitively improve on Wei Yi's play. That's not a criticism of Wei Yi at all. It's just an appreciation of the beautiful options at White's disposal. And the way Wei Yi does play is thoroughly enough to win the game. However, the strongest move here, forcing mate and nine, according to Stockfish, is pawn to c4. A really, really beautiful move. Now, obviously, one point is to cover d5, or maybe not so obviously, but one point is to cover d5 here. And after black accepts, there's really not a better option. The point is that the queen is going to have access to the c4 square in a critical line, and she doesn't have it after, or if you don't play the move c4. So here, queen takes g6 check, king to d5, and the beautiful queen f7 check here is mating. If the king runs to e4, you just take on c4 and you're mating on the f file. But most importantly, if the king goes to c6, you have queen takes c4 and checkmate in one. What a move this c4 is. Let me show the other mate real quick. If the king runs over to e4, it's a little more prosaic, but still a nice checkmate after you take here on c4. Then you get the rook to the f file, and then you get the queen in here, and you have a nice mate here with the bishop and queen combining. Great stuff. However, that's not what Wei Yi played, but his move also wins the game, although Stockfish doesn't realize it at first. His move here is queen to f7 one of those subtle quiet moves we talked about in the introduction. Now, this move covers the d5 square so the king cannot fall back, and you are threatening here queen to f3 and checkmate. There's, you're also threatening bishop g1. I should mention that. You're threatening bishop g1 as well. So because of the two threats of checkmate that you have here, there's actually only one defense. And that's actually a good exercise. Pause your video here if you want to try and figure out the one move that black has that does not get checkmated in one move. Black's only move is bishop to f6. This covers the f file so that the king has room to run over here, and also it stops the move queen to f3 checkmate. So that's the only move to continue the game. Now, in this position, Wei Yi repeats just for a moment, presumably gaining time on the clock, but after the king falls back to e4, he does find the decisive continuation here. He plays queen to b3, yet another one of the immortal quiet moves in this game. After queen to b3, there's the huge threat of queen to d3 and checkmate. There's no way to defend the d3 square or to make an escape square, for example, by somehow vaporizing the pawn on e5. So you have to run back here with king to f5. Now the rook gets into the action with rook to f1 check and the king runs over to g4. It's quite the journey that the black king has already been on at this point. Now, after the king runs over to g4, we need another brilliant move. You can pause your video if you want to figure out how you introduce the queen into the attack. First, a wrong way to introduce the queen into the attack. That's the move pawn to c4. It looks like queen d1 check should be enough to finish the game here. You've opened up this line, but in this case, black has a resource. Bishop takes g2, king takes g2, and the black queen gets in on the long diagonal. Good stuff. After the king falls back, the queen has access to e4. Now, the black queen is so strong in the central position here that although you can win a little material back with rook takes f6, black is no worse in this crazy, crazy, crazy position. Of course, we're not going to allow that, and what Wei Yi does instead is just play queen to d3. 
This also intends to introduce the queen into d1 or e2, but it covers the e4 square. So after black does, as in the analysis that we looked at a moment ago, sacrifice on g2, there will be no queen e4 from black. Now, I do want to mention that there were alternatives to bishop takes g2, the game continuation that we'll look at in a moment. There is a huge threat here of queen takes g6, which is mating like right away. If you try to defend that square with, for example, rook to g7, then we can play queen to e2 check, king h4, and to get more than a perpetual here, what we need is the move pawn to h3, which threatens queen to g4 and checkmate. If black tries to defend that square with queen to d7, or queen to c8 here, then we have king h2, beautiful move, threatening pawn to g3 in checkmate. I love that. Now after bishop takes g2, eliminating the pawn so there can be no pawn g3, queen takes g2 is decisive. The queen is going to be able to successfully checkmate here in combination with the rook. I'll give the line rook f8, which defends f6, and queen g3 check, king h5, queen f3 check, and then after king h4, we have here rook to g1, threatening uh, rook g4, which should actually win, but actually bishop f2 is unstoppable mate in one. Bishop f2 is actually the strongest threat in this position. So, in the game, not allowing that, black after queen d3 decided to go for bishop takes g2 check here. The king does check on g2 here and queen a8 check. The king has to fall back to g1 here. And remember, the reason we put our queen on d3 is there's no queen e4 in this position. So because we're threatening queen takes g6 and checkmate here and also queen e2 is a winning threat. Black tries bishop to g5 in this position. We go queen e2 check. The king is forced over to h4 right here. We have bishop f2 check, king h3, and here the next move made Bruzon resign. We get bishop to e1. Another beautiful quiet move finishes the game, and Stockfish actually announces mate and six in this position. Now, the main threat is simply rook to f3 check and mate here, and there's no good response for black. I'll give a few lines here. Um, I'll mention also queen d3 is a winning checkmate threat as well. So both rook f3 and queen to d3 are huge threats. One move that would try to stop both is pawn to e4 here, but that cuts off the queen's defense of g2. So then you get queen g2 checkmate. It's like e4 almost covers everything, but then it opens up another threat that you were defending against a moment ago. Also, if bishop f4, which seems like a good defensive try here, then you do get that queen d3 check we talked about, king g4. Now queen takes g6, and the bishop's not on g5, so this is crushing. Bishop to g5 here, and then pawn h3 check. You have to take, and okay, this would mate, but this is actually checkmate in one, so it's even better than queen h5, which is a bit of a more standard checkmating pattern. So after bishop e1, the uh, most natural defensive line that we'll look at here is queen a7 check, king h1, queen to b7 check. You get rook f3 check. Now the rook is pinned and that might seem like a problem, but it doesn't matter because after king g4, queen check, king over, then you're still able to move it because the queen has gotten in the way of this pin, so the rook is unpinned. And now you get one more block, the bishop on e1 helps out, and you get rook takes h4 and checkmate. What a game. This actually reminds me a lot of the composed game or likely composed game, Adams versus Tory with an amazing series of back rank checkmates. Here, Wei Yi just keeps finding the only move to keep the black king in the box and to continue to threaten checkmate with all of these quiet moves. Now, if you like the video, then of course check out the playlist over here on the chessboard with more of my favorite games of the 2010s. And as always, if you like the content, then you can like, subscribe, or hit the bell to be notified of future videos.